This week I'm drinking an iced Americano with a double shot of espresso. That much caffeine makes it feel like you're speeding. It reminds me a lot of my very special next guest, IndyCar star James Hinchcliffe. This is a cup of Joey with me, Joey Molinaro. I appreciate you uh, taking the time on your Friday, man. This is uh, this is great. Of course, man. Happy to yeah. happy to do it. Thanks for having me on. How was um? How, how you said you had to get into the uh, garage before this? How, how was that? Yeah, yeah. Just I just swung by the race shop just to do some uh, some last minute prep on everything there before we ship it all off to the track on Monday and uh, start setting up for the big one. The big one. That's right, man. Did you ever think you'd see that uh, an August five hundred? I mean, what, what, what's going on? <laughs> Uh, no, you know, it's, it's so weird. I mean, you know, the race has been going on for over a hundred years and they took a couple, couple years off during the two wars, but it's always been run in May. It's always been run with fans when it's been run. So this is definitely going to be one of the weirdest, you know, kind of most unique 500s, but Hey, at least we get to do it. At least we get to put it on. And, and that's what matters. I mean, we're here to put on a show for the fans. It sucks to not be able to like share it with them in person because that's such a cool experience. Things having escalated to the point where we just couldn't have the race at all. Yeah, for sure. Beyond like the hour leading up to, you know, the, the parade laps and the green flag dropping, you know, do you even really realize that there's fans once you're out there? Yeah, so it's, it's a great question. So the answer is no. We, we don't sure. have that same... Like we call it like the arena effect, you know, when you can hear the, the crowd and you, you get pumped up, you know, amped up by the energy, your home crowd, whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, we we kind of get that, like you say, that kind of hour leading up to it and certainly after the race, but from, from green flag to checkered flag, you, you're so focused on what you're doing. Obviously the engine's super loud, you can't hear anything, um, but it's, it's funny because for the 500 especially, right, we spend, a, couple of weeks at the track we're on track i think like 12 days in the month and you do thousands of laps of practice and with the exception of a little bit on qualifying day and a little bit on carb day you know the, the stands are fairly empty as you go around the track right and then all of a sudden you know you do driver intros and you're just looking at an absolutely patched grandstand in the front and then you do those parade laps and it's the first time all month. So the first time in a year, you know, since the last time you did that race that you see the entire place just packed and you, you get to really enjoy it in those few couple minutes before the green, you're going around, you see every corner, you see how packed it is, you know, then who's all there and, and what you're really doing it for. And, and then the green flag drops and it's focused forward until the checkered. Right. What's the, what's the moment that gets, you know, gets a belly, gets the jubblies going a little bit. You know, what's, what's the, is it, is it the driver introduction? Is it the green flag drop in? What's the one moment that you're like, oh shit, here we go. Yeah. The, the driver introduction is pretty special, man. It's, it's really, really cool um, to be introduced to 350,000 people, you know, in the largest arena on earth and the largest single day sporting event on earth. It's, it is pretty special. And especially, like I said, after you've spent, you know, two, three weeks at the track, and it looks nothing like that. And then all of a sudden it's just this explosion of color and life. And it's, it's just so cool. And then you know, it's all the pageantry around it. Right. So you do the intros and then you're on the grid and it's taps and it's back home again in Indiana and it's the anthem and the flyover. And it's just, you know, it's a, it's a much, much more elaborate sort of pre-race ceremonies and all that stuff gets you going. And then you get in the car and they say driver starts your engine. And, and that's when, butterflies are going like crazy and you're just trying to trying to keep your head in the right space before you uh before you go to battle do you do you know if there's going to be all that still without any fans like the back home again you know what I, I yeah i don't know i mean i assume we're not going to do taps right because it's not memorial day and and that's you know pretty sure. pretty tied to that um, but I, I don't know how much of the other sort of traditional pre-race activity you know i imagine the anthem is going to be a recording you know of someone's probably not going to be someone on property so it's yeah it's definitely going to have a different feel so okay so long story short of all my questions that i asked you you don't really notice it once that first hour is over but it's not going to be that much different for the driver right. with no right in there we once the race gets going yeah i saw that you're a movie guy in your instagram yes. profile you said you're a yes. big movie watcher you, as you can see behind me, I got a lot of Star Wars stuff. Are you a Star Wars guy at all? 
Yeah, for sure. I'm a I'm a space nerd. So like I love real space. I love sci-fi space. I love all things kind of space related. Was that like when you were a kid and you had to do like astronomy projects and stuff and you started then? You know what? So my I've got an older brother. He's three years older than me and yeah. he was a big space guy. And so, you know, when you're a little brother, you just do what your older brother does. That's just what's cool, cool. right? And like we we went to space camp down at Cape Canaveral. And then we went to space Academy at, um, at the facility in Alabama. Um, and I just, I was just was always fascinated by it, you know, and he was a big star Trek fan growing up. So I was a big star Trek fan and obviously got into star Wars. And I've, it's one thing that like, I, I mirrored of my big brother growing up that I haven't lost at all. And I still like nerd out about space all the time. And the, the funniest is I, it's the only thing that I've really like tried to blatantly exploit like whatever position or like celebrity I have because anytime we'd go to a race where there was like some kind of NASA facility within a reasonable distance, I would call any car PR department and be like, we need to do some kind of PR stunt with me at the Johnson Space Center outside Houston. I'm like, yeah, no problem. <laughs> call them up and we've got like all these cool like backstage tours of different facilities and got to do all this cool stuff. and. Um, I became buddies with one of the guys that was actually, he did a six month stint up on ISS and he would call my cell phone from the space station. And it was just like, Holy like you can't nerd out as a space geek any more than like chatting on the phone to some guy that's floating around space. Yeah. So do you think, uh, do you think the earth's round or are you a flat guy? No, I'm, I'm pretty convinced it's round. Did you get confirmation from any of those people or they kind of keep it low? No, they're, they're pretty public about their belief that it's round. Okay. I feel like that as well. But then, you know, you can on a rabbit hole on YouTube or Netflix and it's like, I don't know, maybe it's- I could be, <laughs> you spend enough time on YouTube, you could be convinced of pretty much anything. <laughs> exactly. Well, you're an IndyCar driver. I'd say that's like, you know, compared to speed and like G4, like, I mean, that's kind of like the next level is Astronaut, right? Like, I mean, you, you that could be a pretty it's... fair jump from going to what you do on a consistent basis to then straddle me up and fire me to space. Yeah, there, there are, we like make the joke, you know, there are very few people that can argue they've got a cooler job than we do as yeah. IndyCar drivers. Astronaut's one of those people. They've got a solid argument. People are always like, would you go to space if it was like, you know, like a vacation almost? And it's like, you know, just all expense paid for. And I was like, I really don't think I would. Just because really? being strapped in and like the countdown going like in a movie, you know, and then you're just firing. I, I, I would not, no, I can't, I, I, I couldn't do it. So, I mean, would you, you know, go we, if you have a chance, obviously? Oh, or I'd, you... I'd go tomorrow. I'd go tomorrow. Really? Yeah, but I'm, I'm wired wrong. So like racing drivers don't have like the self-preservation gene that most humans are born with. That's how we do what we do. Um, we're, we're somewhat, we're not quite as risk averse as the average person. That's like a whole nother level though, right? Because at least when we're driving a race car, a certain number of things, certainly not everything, but a, a much higher degree uh, of things are in my control. We're like, you strap into a rocket, boy, you're, you're along for the ride. I mean, that's, they don't, they don't do anything these days. They just, they just yeah. strap in and sit there and their work starts once they get there. The, the journey is totally out of your, out of your control. And that part worries me, but. Exactly. So in space movies, you got Armageddon, you got Interstellar. Ad Astra, The Martian. What are you going with? What's your favorite space movie? Well, that's a tough one. So, like, I mean, Armageddon's a classic, right? I mean, it's and, it, and it was so fun. much. It was so much better than Deep Impact, which came out at like the exact same time, right? Which was super weird. Right. Um, so I, I've probably seen that one the most. I love the science involved in The Martian. Like, I, you know, I, I read the book and then saw the film, and like, they did a really good job of like actually, like, because you know, nerd. So like, I love the. Oh. Armageddon's cool, but like it's a Michael Bay film, right? It, it's it's there's some a lot of liberties taken with the physics of what's happening. Sure, yeah. Um, but then like Apollo 13 is probably just my favorite of all time. Oh because, my god! Wow. I you know it's so fun. yeah, like so accurate. It's it's such an incredible story of how like human ingenuity saved these three people and what they went through and how they filmed it, like building the sets in the vomit comet and having to do those like parabolic flights yeah. and shooting all the floating scenes at like 30 to 40 second intervals at a time kind of thing. Like how they made that film was just so fascinating to me as well. So that one's probably my number one. What What's crazy to me about that is I, I saw a stat somewhere that said uh, the first trip, the first like Apollo trip that went up into space had 
less technology, like like less technological ability than your iPhone. Yeah, that I like. I, I that is just absolutely stunning to me. Like the balls on that guy. Yeah, to go up there with, and then now we have this, and I yeah. still go up there. That's insane. It, in uh, in one of the tours, I want to say it was the, the facility in Alabama. They they have it's like a giant O ring uh, that was a part of the rocket, and it was kind of all the brains. So it was all like essentially what's the computer chips now, and like the computer chips back then were like briefcase size, right? right. And this is kind of the brain of the whole launch process, at least. And that's the part they're like, yeah, this is like a 32 bit processor, you know, and and these things you could you could probably remote control ISS from this if you wanted. Like it's it's insane what they did with what they had available and how they did it it's just crazy right i know man it really is what other movies you've been watching over quarantine like before you guys got started back up what, what's what's been your go-to you know we uh i watched a couple movies that i think were you know they were made to be released but then because of whatever they just released them on netflix or released them on no. hulu and it was like a couple of films that i'm not sure i would have gone to the movies to see uh -huh. but then i saw them. was actually pleasantly surprised so like king of staten island yeah watch that one mm -hmm. yeah that was a way better movie than i was expecting it to be and like uh he did a way davis did a way better job than i was expecting as well like he's like a pretty good actor. I get he was playing Pete Davidson, like it wasn't like a huge stretch sure. character wise, but still, I mean, acting's acting and he did, I thought he did a really good job. Good story. Um, yeah. We watched um, Palm Springs on, on Hulu, the kind of like Groundhog Day ripoff. Oh, with uh, Andy Samberg. With Andy Samberg, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I've heard good Again, I've pleasantly seen. surprised. Yeah, there's some, there's some funny bits in there. It's pretty well done. Movies, I feel like it, you know, it could be a good microcosm of like life. It's like sometimes if you just go in with low expectations, for sure, you'd be pleasantly surprised. For sure, go. that's what's tough about things like Star Wars franchise or any franchise film, exactly. Right? Yeah. Because by the time you get to like number three, if you're still hitting it by number three, everybody's expectations are just through the roof. And it's hard to not be at least mildly disappointed at the end of a film. And it's no, it's like, it's not, it's really not their fault. It's more your fault for going in with outrageous expectations. Absolutely. I mean, it, so you, you've done commercials, you've been on TV, you do TV, good looking guy. You, you want to, any, any thought about getting into movies, acting at all? No, I mean, so my wife's an actress and I see what she has to deal with on set and I'm like, I'm good. That's, that's fine. <laughs> I like the commentating stuff I've been able to do and like live TV kind of stuff. It's kind of exciting. Um, but like the scripted stuff, man, the, the, what, it's, what, it's kind of stuff? What, 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 what on set does she go through? So it like the hours, the repetition, the the number of people, like if you've been on a set for a commercial or a movie shoot or a TV shoot or whatever, what always what always blew me away was how many people are involved to make it all happen. And there's a when you have that many people and they're all kind of like part of their own little groups. You got the sound guys over here and hair and makeup over here and production over here and props over here and grips over here. And they all they're, they're a little clicky sometimes and they're their own unions and it's just coordinating that many people is such a nightmare. And the last people they care about in a lot of in a lot of cases is the talent. They're like They'll just like change. That seems it's backwards so, to me. It, I know, I know, but it's it, they'll they'll change up timing and like they'll be like, oh yeah, we need your call time six a.m. So she'll go in at six a.m. It's like, oh yeah, your first scene is not actually till one thirty p.m. because we changed it, changed the the shot list kind of thing. And so you're just sort of sitting around after waking up at four thirty to get ready to get there and and then you know shoots. I mean, depending on the type of scene, it just the repetition and trying to like keep your energy up when you're doing the 14th take of this two minute scene, it gets, yeah. it is hard work, man. Like acting's an awesome job. It's anyone that gets to do it is super lucky for sure. And she loves it. But I, I see some of the stuff. I'm like, I don't know if I'd have the patience for it, you know? And then you get into movies like, like big, big productions with CGI and all that kind of stuff. And yeah. all that stuff goes up exponentially, right? You know, when you've got green screen stuff and big action scenes and all this sort of thing, like the amount of preparation is incredible. And um, like, I remember I saw this, um, did you see um, 1917? I have not yet, no. Definitely check it out. On the list, yeah. um, and, and And it's funny, cause I was sitting there. So because because Becky's in film and, and I've done a little bit of it, like we like, we like picking apart movies and like, yeah. we look at like, we enjoy the cinematography side of it and we like critique the directing a bit more or whatever. 
And so we went to the movies and I hadn't really heard much about the movie. We went and saw 1917. I'm sitting there and I'm about eight minutes into the movie and I'm thinking, they haven't cut yet. Like this has been <laughs> one continuous shot. Yeah. And I'm like, this isn't, and then I watched the rest. And obviously that I, I found out after the fact that was like the whole shtick of the movie. And I watched this like 12 minute sort of, you know, mini doc on how they made it. That was on YouTube uh, or on HBO, I think actually. And it was phenomenally complicated. Yeah. And I, they deserve so much credit for how they pulled it off. But I find that stuff super fascinating. Just think about it. I mean, if one, you know, fucking schmo in the background messes it up and then it, the whole thing's just out of whack. I mean, it's insane. And like, and some of the resets on these, like, it's not even just the time, but like the reset of all the lights or the, if there's explo you know, if there's explosions or, you know, pyro of any kind or whatever. I mean, it's man and like they had to build this set this like continuous they bought this massive plot of land and just had to like they started out by holding the script and walking as they talked out the entire script They're like okay we need this much land and then they kind of reverse engineered it it's incredible man it's such a cool story do you think that that was like kind of a cover for them to be like oh this is the main storyline of the movie what i'm saying is if it was shot like a normal movie would it have been as good because everybody's like oh man it was one shot so the I I don't think so. I don't think it would have been as good because the whole point of doing it that way from the director's standpoint was he wanted you to feel like you were in it. You were walking the trenches with them. You were you were shoulder to shoulder with them going through all the same yeah. stuff. And if if the shots were different and cutting around and big aerials and whatever, like you probably wouldn't have that same feeling. So I think it I did it, it did create a bit more of an immersive experience, I think, for the for the viewer, which was I thought was awesome. So let's talk about you a little bit. So I saw on your Instagram, you just you just celebrated your one year anniversary. I did. Yes, I did. I, my, mine's coming up yeah. as well. It'll be a year in September. Uh, so congratulations! Yeah, congratulations to you as well. How'd you meet your wife? Uh, high school. I, I, okay, I was going back and I saw and I, I didn't. You know, I figured that was the case. So wow, high school sweethearts. Well, yes and no. So we I, I were still friends that linked back up. She was two years below me in school, but I was buddies with, I was buddy, we, we had a lot of the same friends. Her yeah. brother uh, is my age. And I, I had had a girlfriend my, my senior year and we broke up like two weeks before prom. And I, you know, and I knew that Becky knew a lot of my friends. So I was like, hey, do you want to come? Like just as a friend, you want to come? So yeah. technically she was my prom date, though she wasn't a date date because she was way too cool and way too pretty for me at the time. Yeah. Uh, to totally fair play. And <laughs> then we kind of went our separate ways and, uh, you know, she pursued a career in, in acting and, and I pursued my career in racing and it both sort of worked out. And then we, uh, we reconnected back in, uh, it would have been late 2015. We both happened to be in LA. I was out testing uh, the IndyCar at uh, Fontana and she was out there for some auditions and we had a free night. We're like, oh, hey, let's go grab dinner. And that was it. So did you make the first move then? Did you, did you hit her up? No, she hit me up. She slid in my DMs. Wow. Yeah, because I'd had a, I'd had a really bad accident uh, in May uh -huh. of 2015. Yep, yep. And so it was like, you know, she waited a couple months and she just kind of reached out on Facebook being like, hey man, I just, I saw everything that happened. I just wanted to reach out and see how you were doing and make sure everything's good or whatever. And, and that was kind of how the conversation started. There you go. Look at you. Yeah, so she gets I'm the credit. You make the first move. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> That's great, man. She, you're a big, she liked the beard. I saw you didn't have the beard in high school. Maybe you couldn't grow it. Is this, is she into the facial hair now? Oh yeah, big time. Cause if I shave it, I look like I'm still in high school. And remember <laughs> she didn't date that guy. So. <laughs> Got it. Got it. That's fair. That's fair. How's the podcast going? You still doing that? It's, yeah, it's going well, man. So yeah, Rossi and I do off track with Hinch and Rossi and, okay. um, it's, it, we actually just did a deal with Sirius. So it's going to be on the IndyCar channel on Sirius XM and it's going to be available through their app. And um, I think our, our last episode was actually going to be on the Dan Patrick channel. So it's, it's, it's cool, man. It's kind of actually starting to take off a little bit and don't yeah. understand it. I mean, it's literally just Alex and I and our, you know, jackass producer that chimes <laughs> in way too often, you know, shooting the breeze about nothing, but apparently it's, it's, it's going all right. But that's one of my favorite things about IndyCar and about IndyCar drivers is that you guys have such personality and you, you, you're so good about 
you know, from my experience, I'm from Indianapolis. That's where I'm based right now. I'm in Indianapolis. I grew up okay. here. So, so, you know, the 500 and, and the track is that's something I'm very accustomed to. But the way you guys interact with the fans and, and the way you are on social media and then you do podcasts and you just, I mean, you're, you're such likable guys that, of course, a podcast is going to blow up. Well, I, pre I appreciate it. <laughs> you obviously haven't spent that much time with us yet. Well, but I no, mean, it's, I, no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. It's honestly, it's one of the coolest parts of our job is getting to, is getting to interact with fans. Yeah, What's cool yeah. about being an IndyCar driver in this era mm -hmm. um, is that, you know, so IndyCar's always prided themselves on being, you know, accessible to fans and whatever, yeah. but only so many fans can make it out to a track. And even if you're at the track, our time is pretty limited. We only get so much time to actually interact with people, but social media has really changed the game for, I mean, I think all pro athletes, mm -hmm. uh, but IndyCar drivers and, and, and NASCAR drivers and F1 drivers, I think a lot of motorsports people have really embraced that as a cool way to be able to interact with fans. And for me, it comes from a place of, I was, I was a, I was a kid who was a big fan of racing long before I ever got to drive anything. And so I was the kid with the Sharpie and the hero card chasing Mario Andretti around the Honda Indy in Toronto, you know, and I remember thinking back, you know, when, when kind of social media really started picking up, man, if, if I could have tweeted at Greg Moore, who was my like driving hero, and there was like a one in a thousand chance that he saw it and like liked it or like, <laughs> heaven forbid, responded. You know, like that would have been, it would have made your year as a 10 year old kid. Are you kidding me? Absolutely. And so we have this, we have this, uh, this opportunity now to like do that and spread that good feeling with fans on, on social media. And so I, I love it. I think it's great. Did you ever get, to, when was the first time you got to go to IMS? Cause I know you, you, you're, you're from Canada. So what was the first yep. time? So my first trip to IMS was in 2004. I was racing in a series that was supporting uh, the Formula One race when it used to be there. So the first time I saw it was actually around the US Grand Prix. Okay. And then it wasn't until 2008 when I got to see the 500 in person for the first time. And like as somebody that grew up watching it still from home, I mean, seeing it and, and someone that knows racing, someone that liked racing, and someone by that point was well on his way to having a career in racing, it still absolutely blew me away. Blew my doors off first time I saw it. It was so cool. Yeah, that's awesome, man. That's, uh, you, um, you, how long have you been well, going? Well, I've, I've kind of been, I was kind of like a late bloomer a little bit. Like, yeah, obviously I grew up and so it's always been, you know, Memorial Day weekends, race weekend. Like I get the, the fanfare and everything like that. But um, really I started working for like the local radio station out of college in town. And so the past five years really is because I'd always be out there throughout the entire month and be doing, you know, car day right. coverage and the track updates. And then that's really where I fell in love with it. Now it's like a very big part of you know, my life and who I am, but, uh, you know, better late than never, I guess. Yeah. Uh, yeah, for sure. I mean, that's like when I start a bar school, so many people, they just really don't even understand or, or grasp it. You know, they like know of the 500, yeah. but they're like, Oh, is it that big of a deal? I'm like, yes, it's that yeah. big of a deal. Yeah. You know? so if, if you don't see wild. it in person, it's tough to explain to people, man. Even like I said, even someone that knew what it was, I still, I didn't get it. I didn't even. I saw yeah, kind of. I um, so uh, so Rad, Rad Brewing, which is in town here, so formerly Flat Twelve, yeah, downtown. Um, I started with those guys back in like I think 2012 or 13. Uh, we kind of got together and collaborated on a beer called Hinchtown Hammerdown, nice. and uh, and Flat Flat Twelve became Rad Brewing uh, a little over a year ago now, and uh, and so they're still carrying it, and we kind of we sell it during the IndyCar season. It's kind of a seasonal beer, and wanted to make something that was like easy to drink at the track you know so a lot of these craft breweries especially at the time were just trying to like out hop each other and just like who could put you know who, who could make the most yeah who could make the most unpalatable ipa and that was like award-winning craft beer and i was like i don't want i don't want anything i don't want to go anywhere near that world that's not we're not trying to win awards we're trying to sell beer and make people happy you know so like yeah. something you can drink at the track when it's 90 degrees out and whatever and you don't feel like you've eaten a turkey dinner after just having one you know so it's a nice kind of lighter pilsner and it's uh, it's great man so is beer your drink of choice or what's what's your uh, you go to uh, beverage what we got is that uh, it's a whiskey? it's a bottle of weller bourbon yeah bourbon so Very i nice. i uh about three years ago started getting weirdly and uh, maybe a little more than that 
well, I started loosely getting into it um, about five years ago, and then about three years ago, I started getting really into it. And now, you know, now I'm a nerd in that too, like hunting, buying, selling, trading, all that sort of stuff, collecting. Um, it's kind of become a fun little pastime. And I've roped in a few of the other IndyCar drivers in town here. And we've got uh, a little group that gets together, you know, we try to get together once a month, especially in the off season and just bring in a bunch of different bottles, sample new stuff, yeah. try stuff out. So yeah, it's sounds fun. Like a, sounds like a gentleman's evening. A little billiard, yes, very, maybe. very some much cigars. so. Some, some poker, sometimes some cigars, yeah. Yeah, you cigar guy at all? Not really, I'm not. A few of the other guys are, are more so than I am. That's never been conditioning and everything, right? I mean, you don't want to be. Yeah, I mean, cigars aren't too bad, right? But uh, and if you're only if you have one or two a year, it's not a huge deal. But uh, it's just it's not my not my thing as much. But you rarely feel manlier than when you're holding a whiskey and a cigar. You know, whiskey in one hand, a cigar in the other, like looking at a fire or at a poker table or something. So once in a while, you got to do it. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Do you just go on the rocks with the bourbon, or you mix it with anything? Neat, brother. Good lord, I. I'm so I, I maybe I just need to like, get the beard like you maybe get a few <laughs> more years on me or something. I'm not manly enough to do the all the to just the meat. I gotta it's, have a little mix. No, it's it's like anything, right? It's practice. Practice makes perfect. Because I was the same way. I could only have first. I didn't, I didn't like it at all. Period. Then I could I could tolerate it in a mixed drink. And then I graduated on the rocks. And then I you know eventually reached the pinnacle of neat. But it it, it took it took a couple years to get there. <laughs> you say neat, brother. Right off the bat, I love that. That's, that's good for you, dude. Well, um, before I let you go, um, are you going to win the 500? How are you feeling? Yeah, no, for sure. Absolutely. Going down? Okay. That's what, like my buddies at Pardon My Take, they always like to like, get a headline grab. So I'm right. happy here. So out of this, I can just say, okay, James Hinchcliffe says he's going to win the 500 this month. 100%. No questions <laughs> asked. I'll win the 500. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, man. You got to give uh, you got to give Rossi some shit for me. He uh, we were supposed to link up on uh, a video or something a year or two like last last 500 season, yeah. and he kind of left me and my boy at the altar. So give give him a little hard time. Say hey, I will, man. He's got good, you know. He's uh, he's one of the guys that's in our little bourbon group. So I'll I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll I'll put something really bad into a really nice empty bottle and be like, yo, bro, you got to try this. Get them all excited and then let them sip something just awful. And that'll yeah. be like, payback, buddy, Tell payback. Him, yeah, hey, Molin, Molinero. Joey Fetch yeah. says hi. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean. All right, man. Well, uh, I appreciate the time a lot. Um, good meeting you again. And uh, looking forward to the rest of this month, man. Looking Good luck in the race. And uh, I know appreciate you're it, man. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thanks for having me on.